morning. A lot of times we get into when we talk about the power of routine, we get into where Evan was there in the beginning. Uh, but we get into a part of routine where we're just making check marks in our life. We start to die. Like you can notice, I've noticed in my marriage, with my kids, at work, looking at the equipment. Well, when you just start making check marks and say, I got that done, it just doesn't mean as much. You know, I, all right, told Misty I love her, head out the door, got that checked off. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean as much. But when I take the time to look at her and invest in her and make a connection with her and tell her I love her, now that's different. That's the kind of routine we see in our lives as Christians. That's what we see this morning. So Isaac did a couple of things here on the power of routine. And we're going to follow up this morning with fasting. Uh, has any, let me see a show of hands. Has anybody here ever fasted? Yes, we've had some folks who have fasted. Okay, we're going to start out this morning in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, uh, right here. This is when Jesus had just finished up with John the Baptist. He had just been baptized. And before he was ready to go out and start preaching, he went through this part right here. In Matthew 4, verse 1, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So here's what's happened. As soon as we start fasting, as soon as we start stepping out in our faith with God to make something happen, the first thing Satan does is tempts us where? Where were we? In our weakness. In our thought of weakness. If you look at Christ's ministry throughout the Bibles, one of the things, He did two things everywhere He went to do ministry. One was He met large crowds and He fed them the Word of God, right? What was the other thing He always did? He always fed them food. It's something we got to have. Whether we like it or not, we got to focus on our flesh a little bit. we got to focus on our flesh a little bit. But Christ in this situation was being tempted in the weakness of His flesh. Why? Because Satan was wanting to destroy what God was trying to do in His life and do with His life. Fasting is a way that we give up something. We're not just giving it up to say we give it up. We're giving it up to give to, to starve the flesh, to give the spirit a chance to grow, to overcome something. Not just to overcome, but to learn. Maybe it's for vision. Maybe it's for guidance. Maybe it's for direction. Maybe it's for prayer. Maybe it's for a lot of things. But that's where he, he tempted them first, was with that. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's Jesus, who not only has the Spirit of the living God within Him, He has the Word of God. So He's using the Word of God in a way that He can prosper, in a way that He can complete the mission that God has put before Him. But if you'll look up here just a little bit, Satan knows the Word better than any of us. He's amazing in the Word. He's got it memorized by heart. And in verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he says, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So the devil is trying to convince Christ to do what? Exalt himself. To put himself up on a pedestal so that he can look down around all of the people around him so that he can be prideful in all of those things. And Satan tempts us to do that every day in our lives. There are many things in, in our lives that we're not very good at that we need to get done. And the one thing we have trouble doing is what? Asking for what? Help. We have trouble asking for help. I do, because there's certain things in me that are private. I should know how to do that. And I don't. So I've got to go to somebody who, who knows something about that, and I've got to ask them for help in that situation. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to do 
that. I'm not going to exalt myself. Here's the saying. He will command his angels among concerning you that they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And that's right. That's Scripture. The devil is quoting Scripture against Jesus right here. And he's using it against him. But what the devil doesn't have that Christ does have is a Holy Spirit. You're going to meet a lot of people in your life that have knowledge of the Word of God. And they're going to quote it to you in a way that seems genuine. But unless that person has the Holy Spirit guiding the direction that they go in those Scriptures, there's a good chance they may be trying to kill you. There's a good chance they may be trying to lead you the wrong way. Jesus answered him. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test, right? So if I bring rattlesnakes in here this morning and start passing them around, what are you going to say? Get away from me is what you should say. Get that thing away from me. I know God wants what's best for me, but that doesn't mean I have to hold a snake to prove it. You know what I mean? We've got we to be in tune with our spirit in this. And there are times when we get confusion in this. There's times when things, when, when we, you know, the Word is kind of contradiction with one another. We're in, tuned into a couple different frequencies. These are the times to fast. These are the times to seek things. These are the times to ask questions to fit your brothers and sisters around. If something in the Word is not lining up. If something in your life is not lining up. If you need help somewhere. These are when it's time to ask questions. These are the times for fasting. In verse uh, not 8 there, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And we look at that and we say that's despicable, right? Here's Satan asking God to kneel down to him and worship him. I'm guilty. Are you? Have you ever had idolatry in your life? Have you ever had lust? Have you ever had selfishness? Have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever stole? Have you ever did those things? That was me kneeling right down to Satan. Why wouldn't he ask Jesus to do it? He's convinced thousands of people to do it, right? Thousands of people. And we're all guilty. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Thank Him for the blood of Jesus. Again, the devil took Him to that mountain. Okay? Jesus' answer was this. Stay away from me, Satan. Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And then the devil left Him. And the angels came and attended to Him. To me, in today's world, that's like living in this world Monday through Friday. It's a brutal place. Our expectations are so high. You know, I, I was reading the art, an article the other day that talked about life in the 40s and the 50s, where a man would work a 40, dog, 40 hour a week job, and they could afford it. The mom could stay home to raise the children. They could afford a house. They could afford a car, and they could take one vacation a year off of a 40-hour-a-week job. Man, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Now you've got two people working, some of them 60 and 70 and 80 hours a week, just to take care of the mortgage and the car and putting food in the house, let alone making any upgrades or getting ahead or taking a vacation. To me, that's this world anymore. It's tough just to get through it and to be attended to. We need to come to church. We need to get lifted up. I used to, I used to think that I could be a cowboy in this. And you know, I think there are some cowboys out there who can, who can get through life without church. I'm not one of them. I need to come here and I need to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to sing the songs. I need to hear the message. I need to be a part of things. That keeps me upbeat in my faith. Keeps me up. I'm encouraged by the people around. But that's what Satan was trying to do with him here. He was simply trying to drag him away. And Jesus fasted through this process. 
And that's what we need to take a look at. <laughs> I've seen guys at work. I work in a pretty rough place. The power station, a lot of good guys there. But man, they're rough as cops. They are rough as cops. And when you talk about missing a meal, I mean, I've watched guys go skidding across the floor with each other. You're going to get them fired up. There's going to be a fight at some point. And that's how it goes. So when you're talking about starving the flesh, this needs to be a spiritual thing. But listen to me. It's not just food. You know, in the Old Testament, they associated uh, fasting with like the yeasts and the unleavened breads and things like that. And here Christ is talking about removing food completely from His diet. But I want you to think about something for a second. It's not. It's what keeps you from God. That's what fasting means. What takes precedence between you and God? I'll use my son Wyatt as an example. Why? I can sit there and tell him, why are not eating this week? He say, I don't care. <laughs> don't bother me. Let me know when there's something out there. He's just one of those kids that doesn't eat. But now, if I went to Wyatt and I said, give me your game board. Now, that's different. There's a good chance I'm going to have to lock my door while I'm sleeping. He will find a way to get even if I take that game. You know what I mean? That's something he loves. That's something he's connected to. He can understand that. Right? You have anything? What's that, what is that thing in your life? What's that thing in your life? Maybe, maybe it's not a, a, a eggs and bacon. Maybe it's something else. That's what fasting is. Is giving up something that takes away from God. I've seen some people talk about chocolate and all these things. But that's another thing I want to get into here in a second. You don't want to... We'll go to that a little bit later. We'll go to that a little bit later. But if I take this light switch, Angie, can I mess with your lights? Sure. Okay. Good work. Did you see the one in the middle go out? Yeah. Somewhere out here in these lines, there's a power source. Okay? There's energized electricity coming through all of these lines. And they're trying to get to that light. And that light is the goal. Okay? We're the light. Christ is the power coming through those lines. He's trying to get to us. He's trying to get our light to shine. He's trying to get there. But sometimes he just can't make the connection. Because there's something between us and him. There's something that's not allowing that to connect. And there's sometimes we need to find a way to make it connect. We need to, to turn the switch on. We need to make those two together so that that power can flow through there. What is that standing in your way? Is there something in the way of keeping that connection with Christ to keep your light from shining. Hey, mine's been turned off a couple times. <laughs> sometimes it's burned out. Sometimes it's been unscrewed, thrown away. Sometimes it's been broken. All kinds of things happen to your life. Sometimes I lose it. I don't know how I lose it, but I lose it. Where did I put that? I got to be looking for it. That's our walk with Jesus Christ. That's when we talk about fasting. We're talking about making the connection. Angie and I were talking this morning. If I get into a life where I'm just making check marks, I'll die. I can't do it. I need something spontaneous. I need something spur of the moment. You know what I mean? It can't just be day and night with Misty every Friday night for the next 17 years. I've got to have something spontaneous with her. Something's got to uh, be in there that generates some excitement. Let fasting be that for you. Let fasting be a step that takes the next step. It doesn't have to be something that's hard. It doesn't have to be complete suffering and misery. I think we go to Matthew chapter 6 next. In 16 through 18. Here's where I feel like a lot of us fail in our fasting. And I know, I got on Facebook now and I love it. I heard all of these bad things for years about Facebook. And now I can't stay off of it. I like it. Because I get to, like over Christmas, I got to see what was going on with my cousins in Georgia and South Carolina. You get to see the pictures of Christmas Day. There's awesome things on there. But you, you know, there's some other things on there too. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to let it bog you down today. You don't have to let it affect you. You just scroll on past it. It's, a little, it's only one little flick of the finger and they're gone, okay? 
But Facebook is good. But one thing I see a lot of people doing on there is say, well, I'm giving up chocolate for Lent. Or I'm giving up this for Easter and all these things. But let's look at this. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Ouch. Ouch. How many times do you see people talking about what they're fasting about? God saying, shh. When you fast, it ain't nobody's business. When you fast, it's between God and you. It's not between you and the clergy or you and the priest and you and the guy at work or you and Facebook or you and your email. When you fast for something, it is between you and God. And if you speak it to anybody, you've already lost what God is wanting to do with you. You've received your reward in full. You've said, look at me. Look at me. Oh, I'm fasting for the Lord. Well, that ain't going to work. That might work for you in the way people view you, but it's not going to work for you and God. He desires. He's more. He's deeper than that. It says, but when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's a personal relationship. That's one-on-one. -on -one. For some things that God wants to do for you, that's only for you. Amen? Amen. There's sometimes my children uh, need to be able to come to me and they need to be able to say things to me which inside I want to scream at them. I want to yell at them. I want to be mad at them. I want to punish them in my flesh. But I, my kids need to know that they can come and talk to me. And no matter what they say to me, I love them. <coughs> I forgive them. It's unconditional. It's a God -back. It never ends. And it never changes. And when I can get to that point with my kids that they can talk to me like that, that's when I'm good. That's when I can see things start to happen. God wants that same relationship with us. He wants, to know, he wants us to know that we can come to Him and we can say anything to Him. Anything. I promise you, there's not very many people on the face of this earth that you will be able to do that with. Give it to God. Give those things to God. But when you now, when it talks about doing things in secrecy, it means doing good things in secrecy. You cannot be sinful in secrecy and be blessed. Don't let Satan take this from you. I've watched, I've been in counseling many times where people justify doing sinful things in secrecy because of that scripture right there. Don't let Satan manipulate you like he was trying to manipulate Christ. We'll be deceived, but once we realize that we need to uh, repent of <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9. Jesus is, uh, was questioned about fat fasting. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Well, right here it tells me that these Pharisees and these disciples are already wrong. Why? Because they're telling you that they're doing it, right? Fasting is personal. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. So there's going to be times. What's this say? There's going to be times that my life is full of the Spirit. I'm going to go through seasons when I'm on fire and ministry's just happening. And every time I need a scripture, it's going to pop up. And every time I need to get something done, it's like it just happens. That spirit is alive in me and it's just clicking. But this shows me that there's also other seasons in our life. When the bridegroom isn't there as much. And that spirit isn't on fire as much. You see, because I'm going to have seasons when I'm hot, but I'm going to have seasons when I'm cold, too. 
And Jesus is saying, and in those cold seasons, this is when you fast. This is when you seek me. This is when you search me. When you feel like you're lacking something, when you need something more, fast in these times. No one sews a patch on an unshrunk cloth uh, on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the wineskins will burst. They'll run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Now, where I work now, it's brutal on my clothing. And a couple of years ago, Misty finally said, all right, I'm not sewing anymore. No more patches. If you need pants, go buy them. <laughs> well, what I would do, I would take those old pants, and I had a new pair of jeans in there that I didn't like, so I cut a patch out of them. I went to Tractor Supply, who has the most awesome stuff you pour on there, Terror. right? What's it called? Tear Bender. Tear Bender. You don't even have to get the sewing machine That's out. Right. And I take that patch and I slap it on there and I hold it for a couple minutes, it gets hot, and boom, I'm done. I got it! <laughs> but what I didn't realize is this scripture right here. I just realized this the other day. My pants would tear around that. Why? Because I was taking new gene material and attaching it to old gene material. So now I know, now I need to take two old pairs and make one good one, right? That's the goal now. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. The goal of fasting is to put new wine into new wine skin. Alright? So yes, Misty was right. I do go get new genes now. <laughs> New wine into new wine skins. But I was trying to figure out a way to hold on to that old pair of jeans. Because they were so comfortable. It's like you put them on and everything just goes where they're supposed to go. So what if it's got holes in it? Man, it feels good. It feels good. It feels right. I'm comfortable there, right? I'm comfortable in those old jeans. That's where I want to be. But God said, sometimes I need you to step in something new into a new way of life. You can't just live comfortable forever, which I could if He would let me. But He doesn't want me there. He wants us to put new wine into new wine skins. As we move forward in the Scriptures here, 1 Corinthians 7 and 5, it says, Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent or time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay. Hear me when I say this. Oneness. Oneness between husband and wife. Oneness. Right? When you're doing those things. In prayer, there's even a time for fasting in that. In that oneness together. To separate yourselves. Okay? For a time. For a time. To be in direct contact with the Lord. Physically, to remove that physical part of your marriage for a season. Now, what is that season? It's something you would be in agreement for. Okay? To pray and to seek the Lord. Are you hearing me? I'm not talking about moving out. I'm talking about physical oneness. Physical oneness. Which is hard to give up, right? Why? Because we <coughs> desire that. The flesh desires that. So when we think about these things, husbands and wives, you've got to be in agreement with where you're going if it affects one another. If what you're going to be fasting upon affects your spouse, and you're not going to be close to them for a while, you need to be in agreement on that. Okay, but you can't just use this because you're mad at them, all right? You can't do that. Because God also tells us not to deny one another what we need. But fasting. You know, the first time I fasted was when I was in college. Um, we had a lady, Charlotte Wade was our uh, nursing instructor. She taught like biology and a couple other things. But she told us to do a juice fast for just to cleanse our system. And we, she, she said to don't do anything but orange juice for a whole day. This was killing. I drank nothing but orange juice for a day. And the next day, I'm telling you, she was right. You were clean. You were really clean. It got all the bad stuff out. There was nothing else in there. And I think, but that really is what a spiritual fast can do. 
you know, Ken Willis and I, last summer we started looking at a different physical fast to where we would eat all of our meals in an eight-hour window, and then the rest of the day we wouldn't eat anything at all. That was called a 16-hour fast. And that the sole purpose of that fast was physical. We were trying to get our bodies, one, to use up all of the energy that we had in there and give it sufficient time to repair itself. That's a physical fast. This is a spiritual fast. What is something that you can give up? What is something that you can take out and take away for a season, maybe permanently, to give God time to grow, to give time to God to reveal things to you, to provide you with a new vision, to strengthen you, to uplift you, to do things like that? It's tough. Fasting is tough. Like I say, watch guys get in a fist fight over missing one meal. But you know, as you grow, as you grow in it, you start to see the benefits of it. This isn't a sermon I could have preached to you ten years ago. But as I'm getting older, things change and requires me to do more stuff, not just spiritually but physically. I can see the values in it now. But it's not easy. And there's been many times that I failed. I remember one time I was going to go a uh, full seven-day fast. And I'm going to give this to you as a teaching tool. It's nothing I'm doing right now. I was going to go out for a full seven-day fast. I made it for five days. And I ate on Friday. Oh, I ate. When I finally took that first bite, I was like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. I was pulling everything inside. And I felt like a failure at the end of it. And I knelt down and I prayed that night. And God said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit. Too hard on ourselves. We're hard on our we see the world around us being so critical and hard on everybody around us that sometimes we treat ourselves like that. Yeah, I meant to go seven days. I made five, and the Lord did a lot of work in those five days. So if you fall short, you don't come be proud of the one day or the three day or the five days. That's if any of us, if any of us could have been perfect in any part of this, we would have been the ones on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we're not. We're not. So if you fail, if you fall short, be humble enough to just kneel before God and say, I didn't get there this time. I didn't get there. But maybe I can the next time. All right? That's it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the for uh, being a part of well, Father God, we pray that the Holy Spirit would manifest in us, Lord God, that He would continue to speak to us, to work in us this week. Father God, in this dismal season of cabin fever and locked up in the house and not enough sunlight, Father God, and struggles to get to work and things freezing up and all of the things that come with January, Father God, Will you restore our spirit, Lord? Will you help us find joy today and peace, Father God? Will you renew a bright spirit in us, Lord God? Will you help us to turn that switch on to make a connection, Father God? Is there something we should fast upon, Lord God? Can you give us a word? Can you tell us how long? We thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for being a part of our lives, our marriages, our relationships with our children and our families and our community, Father God. We pray that you place that mark of the Passover on our homes, Lord. <coughs> That you would help people to pass over. That you would help destruction to pass over our homes, Father God. To make them a place of love, happiness, joy, and growth, Father God. And when the storms do come, Father God, we pray that you would lean on your word and your spirit. And we bind together as family. And we bear that burden as brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, pray.
all God's people say, Amen. Amen.